good evening to everyone and i should specifically thank dr reddana uh, for inviting me to this august audience to give a talk on my topic of interest i think i met dr reddana back in 1984 or 85 when he was in tirupati before he joined university of hyderabad and then we have been associated since then and then he was in university of hyderabad and i was in nizams for some time and then of course i moved back to usa when he told me that the audience will be a mixture i never thought that this would be such a big mixture <laughs> because i was thinking that uh, there will be some industrialist or business people and most of them will be either phd's or md's and i was under the impression that probably university of hyderabad people will come here and this may be a better location for them to come and so i prepared my slides mostly on science but i will try to make sense out of that and i come very frequently to hyderabad once in 3 months or 4 months I spend about 3 uh, to 4 weeks and then again go back for the last 20 years i must have come maybe about 100 times like that it's a big journey but uh, i enjoy because when i most of the time i travel with my wife even for conferences the one of the promises i made to my wife at the time of marriage is i will never travel alone okay and also and probably she also wants to ac accompany me so that you know i don't deviate from my path okay and then of course now she says that uh, she should take care of me even when i am traveling so we travel together uh, to conferences and other places so she knows many scientists in usa better than me and they always tell me how come that das uh, your wife is more knowledgeable than you i said uh, that is a that is a possibility because of the conjugal habit so uh, when i read and called me and asked me to give a talk i was wondering what should the topic i should select because i know that uh, you know in uh, university of hyderabad also many people are too specialized to think about a specific topic on which i can talk then i thought i should select a topic that cuts across the disciplines nowadays in usa we no longer believe in sub specialities in india you have cardiology neurology you know uh, medicine rheumatology and so on so forth but slowly all these spe specialties are being Uh, removed and uh, we for example the department of medicine now will consist of an engineer a computer scientist a statistician a physics person a mathematics person and so on and so forth so we think that nowadays science has no boundaries and every field and every subject can contribute to human biology so uh, we think that human biology is nothing but mathematics physics and chemistry but in biological science so of all, all the human body mechanical advantage is the best it is number 1 in no industry you have a mechanical advantage of one so if you can understand the human body well then it will help the engineering so now there is a new specialty coming up in usa and which probably will come to india also it is called as institute of biology inspired engineering so engineers want to learn from biology all these days we have been developing equipment for surgery and so on and so forth based on engineering principles but now people have realized that we can learn biology and by by imitating biology we can develop better um, not only drugs and other things but also machines that can contribute to human health so with this brief introduction i will be talking about infection inflammation and immunity so we call it as 3i okay so in fact that is one of the specialties which we want to develop because these this infection immunology and inflammation they cut across all disciplines all sub specialties in medicine and so my talk today will be devoted to diabetes cancer and to some extent covid and sepsis 
and I will try to present a, a theme showing that all three diseases are not separate. They are fundamentally same. So we believe that at the molecular level, all diseases are same. Same molecules work in all these diseases. And if we can understand how these molecules are working in different conditions, we will have probably in future one single drug for every disease. So that is the idea. So it may look like a, you know, a very utopian idea and a, a sometimes also a crazy idea. But sometimes crazy ideas are, if they turn out to be good, that make the biology and science move forward very well. Can I have the first slide? Oh, OK. The, can I come to that side to talk? Uh, people who are sitting on the dais, that we have few people and politicians would like to have a big crowd uh, and unless the crowd is there, they don't want to come and uh, talk. That reminded me a meeting which I had about uh, one year or so back at the uh, University of Stanford where I was invited to give a talk. And uh, it was circulated, but I don't know why, what happened. There are only 10 audience in the biology special lecture. And after the lecture, uh, we decided to, with uh, Professor Dixon, to do a collaborative work. And in the process, we identified a new mechanism by which cells die. It is called as a peroptosis. And uh, that is what that is important. So it is not the number of people that is important, but it is the number of people who are interested. And uh, the, I think about six months back, I was invited by uh, Ramchandra Medical College in Chennai. So they asked me, you select a topic, whichever topic you want to talk. Then I said, are you sure? They said, I said, no problem. We have so many doctors and many PhDs and so on and so forth. Then I said, uh, don't say no when I tell, the, tell you the topic title. They said, no, 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 tell. Then I said, the title of the topic, uh, the title of the talk would be, how physicians are inadvertently harming their patients. <laughs> then they said, please, don't talk. <laughs> so uh, we don't realize, uh, many times uh, doctors don't realize that they are harming their patients, though it was not intentional. So maybe some other time I will talk about this. And I told my wife about this topic, then she said, you don't bother about to give a talk on this topic, you write an article and publish it in a journal. They must be bold enough to publish it. But I can tell you, one of the problems with the doctors, because I am a doctor, I know, one of the problems with the doctors is they think that they know too much or they know everything. But I can tell you that if a person, if a physician is very honest, he should say that he does not know anything. I, when I was doing my MBBS, there used to be a professor of medicine. He used to tell us, uh, whenever he used to take uh, classes to explain the, the symptomatology and science in the patients, that when a person completes his MBBS, he thinks that he knows everything in medicine. When he completes MD, then he will realize that he only knows 50% of medicine. And when he becomes a professor, then he realizes that he knows only 25% of the medicine. And when he retires, he will realize that he does not know anything in medicine. So as your knowledge grows, you realize over a period of time that how little you know about what is happening in the human body, in the disease processes, and the type of treatment you are offering, and so on and so forth. So this is very important. It is very important to realize the limitations, the human limitations, limitations of our knowledge, and limitations of our skill, and so on and so forth. So it is with this idea then I thought that uh, when uh, uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Hyderabad, uh, asked me to give a talk the last time when I came, I said, what can I talk to engineers? So I told them, then I will talk to you some very fundamental uh, topic to tell you that there is no difference between diabetes and cancer. 
because they are not familiar with biology and medicine, for them it is very good. Because anyway, they, uh, they don't find any difference between cancer and uh, diabetes. But when you want to talk to doctors and to PhDs, a topic like that, it looks like a, a stupid idea to talk like that. So today I will try to take you, though there is a little bit of molecular biology, biochemistry involved, but I will try to see how I can explain those things uh, uh, to the extent possible. See how there is no difference between diabetes, then you know, COVID and uh, cancer and so on and so forth. Can I have the next slide? Can I no. change the slides here? Yes, okay, thank you very much. So uh, we now think, previously we used to think that as you age, you develop diseases and those called as the degenerative conditions. Like for example, forgetting memory, you know, forgetting things, then developing osteoarthritis, pains in the knees, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, all these things were considered as degenerative conditions. Aging, for example, oh, you all age and so you are degenerating. Now we don't no longer consider them as degenerative conditions. We consider them all as inflammatory conditions. All these conditions are due to inappropriate inflammation. Inflammation means flame. That means the tissues are burning, literally burning. That burning may be very acute, it may be long, long uh, duration, or it may be very severe, it may be very mild, or it will be moderate, depending upon the condition. So, with that idea, uh, we realized that over a period of time, that is it possible that we so-called degenerative conditions or so-called metabolic conditions or cancer have same fundamental issue, but because the targeting tissue is different, you are getting different diseases. So it is like, you know, looking at a, a class of 50 uh, students. In, when they are in the intermediate, everybody is same, everybody is studying the same subject. But down the line, after 10 years or 20 years, all these 15 uh, candidates will be in diff 50 different fields. Similarly, molecules are same, but the way the molecules are attacking each tissue is different, and the target tissues are different, and so you get different diseases. So, the most of the slides I prepared are my recent articles, two articles which I wrote. One is how inflammation and its resolution occurs. And the second thing is a new, new theory of aging. So, aging is not due to damage to DNA or gene expression is different and so on and so forth, but it resides in the membrane, cell membrane. Then, of course, some of the slides are taken from my books which I wrote. One is called as a perinatal strategy to prevent adult diseases. The concept is that you, you, the, when you are in the womb of the mother and in the first four or five years of age, what you do and how your tissues respond to the environment and to diet and other things will determine what disease you develop when you are 50 or 60 years. That means you are already programmed by the time you are in, in the second trimester or third trimester in the mother's womb, what disease you develop when you are 50 years or 60 years of age. So this we call as a perinatal programming and uh, we think that because of this concept you have to develop preventive measures when you are in the first year of age or when you are just born or when you are still in the womb of the mother. So this is a, a new concept and this book I wrote almost 20 years back in 2000. Okay. Now it is uh, closely capping. Then of course molecular basis of health and disease. What is the definition of health? Why you, you get develop disease? and uh, what is the difference between disease and health and so on and so forth. Then one of my recent books has been on metabolic syndrome, that is diabetes, and that was on cancer. Because we, we, our concepts cut across all these disciplines, we could write books on different topics which are totally different. So on the surface of it, they look as though they are different conditions, but in fact, they are not. So let us come to the, the fundamental process of uh, inflammation. So the inflammation can, uh, uh, yeah, you can inflammation can affect any disease in the in the body, any tissue in the body. So every disease you have develop is actually an inflammatory condition, including diabetes. People say that diabetes is due to increased glucose levels, 
insulin is not working properly, no exercise and so on and so forth. They are all right. But underlying that is the, uh, is the inflammatory process. And because of that understanding, we found that insulin has another action other than reducing blood glucose levels. The general belief is that the main action of insulin is to reduce blood glucose levels. And that's why diabetics, when their blood glucose levels are not under good control, they are giving insulin. But we found that in addition to reducing blood glucose levels, it has got some very important action. That is to suppress inflammation. So, of course, this is just a, a slide showing what types of inflammation are there, acute inflammation, chronic inflammation, and so on and so forth. Acute inflammation, generally, when you get, you know, like a COVID, severe COVID, or when you have sepsis, or malaria, those things. When chronic inflammation is like osteoarthritis, diabetes, hypertension, these are all chronic inflammation. Chronic means uh, going on for a very long time, but it is not really very severe enough to produce any pain. But there is some amount of inflammation is going on in the tissues. There are many tish uh, tissues and many molecules are involved in the process of inflammation. And they are all same and so I will come to that a little bit later. So this is one of the slides, uh, 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 very standard slide. This is a very old slide also. When you take normal individuals and estimate their blood glucose levels and their lipid profile, you find that everything is normal. And then you also measure their insulin levels, which is not done routinely in any hospital by any doctors or by any endocrinologist or diabetologist. But I feel that it should be done. So if you look at this slide, the, when you are fasting, your blood glucose levels are, let us say, around 81 or 82. And now you take glucose or you take your full meal and then again to the blood glucose level every hour or every half an hour. This is what is called as GTT, glucose tolerance test. Mm -hmm. you know, then you find that immediately after eating, after one hour, the blood glucose levels goes up by one and a half times or two times. Then over a period of time, in three to four hours time, it comes back to normalcy. So this is the standard uh, way the blood glucose levels uh, respond to food intake. At the same time, if you measure glucose insulin levels, the initially the insulin levels are very low when you are fasting. And the moment you eat food, the insulin levels will increase by almost uh, uh, 10 times or so. Yeah, I think so. Uh, four. four times it increases. So that is expected because blood glucose levels are increasing and so the insulin should be released from the pancreas to reduce the blood glucose levels. But, should the, but see the discrepancy. The fasting blood sugar increases after eating food only one and after two times, but the insulin levels increase by four to five times. So there is a disproportionate increase in glucose level, in insulin levels. And at the end of third, three years, three hours or so, the blood plasma glucose levels will come back to normalcy, to your fasting levels, which is 90, again it will come to 90 or 100. But the insulin levels will continue to be more. There are still two to three times more than the fasting levels. So when we looked at this slide, that puzzled us. And this is a very old slide. Everybody sees, every doctor must have seen, many PhDs must have seen, and doctors must have seen, but nobody questioned why insulin levels does not drop along with glucose levels. Then we thought there is something happening with insulin. Because if insulin levels continue to be high, even though the blood glucose levels have come back to normalcy, the patient should go into hypoglycemia. The blood glucose levels should drop and then it should become unconscious. It will not drop. It will remain at the fasting level only, 90 or 100. But the insulin levels are two to three times the fasting insulin levels. Then we thought insulin is doing something. Then we said insulin is having action other than reducing glucose levels. Okay? And then we said it must be having some action on inflammatory process, which is a very fundamental process in the body. So we measured the one gene expression in the cells, which reflects the inflammatory process. So the moment you eat food, the inflammatory pro the genes that control the inflammatory process are increased, and after three or four hours, they again come back to normalcy. So that means 
one of the functions of insulin is not only to control glucose levels, but also to reduce inflammation. So the insulin levels will continue to be high as long as the inflammatory process triggered by the high glucose levels are present. And only when they come back to normalcy, insulin levels also will come back to normalcy. That is why now the action of insulin is not to reduce glucose levels, but to reduce inflammatory process. So the body has devised a mechanism by which insulin is now directed to reduce inflammation, not reducing glucose anymore. It has reduced the glucose levels to normalcy, and after that its action is now on the inflammatory process to reduce the inflammation. That is the reason why, if it is possible, every patient should have glucose levels and also insulin levels estimated at the same time. But nobody does it. I ask all my patients to get, even though it is expensive, if you can afford it, get it done. This is because if you take two individuals, or the same individual, today your blood group fasting levels are 90. Or let us say you are a diabetic, if your, your blood glucose levels are 200. You do exercise, you take medicines and all those things, your blood glucose levels come back to 100. At that time, you estimate your insulin levels when it is 200. Okay. And then when it comes to 100, again you estimate insulin levels. If your diet control and if your exercise and everything is good, then there should not be any change in your glucose levels much, but your insulin levels should drop. That means insulin should be working now much more efficiently to reduce inflammation. So this is very important. So if you do proper exercise and proper dieting, your glucose levels will remain same, but your insulin levels will start dropping. So that means insulin will now work more efficiently to reduce not only glucose levels, but also to reduce your inflammation. So how do you know when you are doing dieting and exercise that whatever you are doing is right? The right is not by looking at glucose levels, but by looking at insulin levels, which nobody does. Okay, so this is very important because we did a study in 20 medical students who are in the age of 20 to 23, did a glucose tolerance test and estimated insulin levels also. Already their insulin levels were very high, even though glucose levels are normal. That means already they are developing having insulin resistance. They are no longer responding to insulin properly and so the body is trying to compensate it by producing more and more insulin. So for some time it will maintain the insulin glucose levels at normal, but after some time it will fail and then they develop diabetes. And that is why Indians develop diabetes at a very young age. Then of course we did a study to see what happens if you lose weight. When you lose weight, not only your glucose levels and your insulin levels drop, but also the inflammatory process drops. So when you lose weight, the inflammation is much less in the body. So that is the reason why you should try to lose weight as you are advancing in age. Because with the age, inflammation increases. So putting all these things together, we published three, four papers saying that, you know, uh, that insulin is an anti-inflammatory molecule and di diabetes and obesity are uh, due to inflammation and so on and so forth. Based on this concept, in Europe, a multicentric trial was done where insulin was given to patients all those patients who are otherwise sick, even if they are not diabetics. They are not diabetics, they underwent coronary bypass surgery, they underwent a surgery for you know, orthopedic surgery, they underwent some abdominal surgery, or they are very ill and so they are admitted in ICU or acute medical care unit. So, and they don't have diabetes to start with. And they were all given insulin infusions. Continuous glucose infusion was given and glucose levels were monitored. Surprising thing is, when this trial was done, None of these patients go into hypoglycemia because we are giving insulin. Because they are resistant to insulin action and so they would. But the, at the same time, inflammatory markers were also measured and it was found that their inflammation is subsiding as they are getting insulin. So this we call as continuous insulin uh, infusion with continuous glucose monitoring. Of course, we have there the setup where you know we can continuously monitor glucose levels and we can program the, the glucose monitor in such a way that if the glucose levels are 70, it will give a beep. If it is more than 200, it will give a beep. And, but continuous insulin will be monitored. So it was found that when continuous insulin, in, insulin infusions were given, the recovery process is very fast and their hospital stay is reduced by 25 to 30 percent. This was done almost um, uh, 15 years back. 
Okay? And so now it is a standard practice in all USA hospitals and European hospitals to give insulin infusion to all sick patients, irrespective of their diabetic status. But somehow that is not done in India because we don't have the mechanism and to monitor insulin levels, glucose levels continuously and so on and so forth. Okay? So that means we have described a new action for insulin that it is an anti-inflammatory molecule. And this is, of course, further we have done further studies with a Chinese uh, collaborators and we have shown when you give insulin infusion, the recovery of your heart from myocardial infarction is better. Okay, so, uh, so nowadays what we do is when the patient undergoes bypass surgery and when the patient has heart attack, we give what is called as a JK regime, glucose, insulin, potassium, so that the heart recovery process is better. And then, then we wanted to know why this is happening. Why this insulin is, how and how this insulin and how these uh, inflammatory markers are affecting the glucose function, glucose uh, levels and the di diabetic status and what is happening to the pancreatic beta cells. So one of my students from Portuguese he has come to do the PhD. So what we did is everybody does insulin levels, glucose levels and all those things. We said not. Let us look at the pancreatic beta cells what is happening. So this is a slide, you don't have to understand this slide, but the color shows the amount of inflammatory markers in the pancreatic beta cells which secrete insulin. So when you are sedentary and if you don't do any exercise, lot of inflammatory molecules will accumulate in your pancreas. But if you do exercise, all these inflammatory markers are removed from the pancreatic beta cells. And so the insulin production is better and your inflammatory process is much less. So this we have shown in animal study whereby doing what is called as histochemistry and so on and so forth, we have shown that the more exercise you do, it is helpful for you because your pancreatic beta cells will work better because they don't have any inflammatory markers accumulating in the pancreatic beta cells. So that is why the exercise is beneficial. So in summary what we have described is that glucose is an inflammatory molecule. That means every time you are eating food, you are producing inflammation in your body. But at the same time, insulin is produced so that it can suppress this inflammation. But if you continue to eat, or you continue to eat more, then inflammation continues to occur and that ultimately produces various diseases. That's how you develop diabetes, obesity, myocardial infarction and so on and so forth. So in other words, food is inflammatory. That means food produces inflammation. You don't have to have any, any disease from outside or anything. The very eating your breakfast, lunch itself is inflammation. But you try to make it in a regulated fashion and try to control it. That is the reason why you have to eat less food so that less inflammation is produced. Then of course we have found that you know uh, this glucose, whatever food you take, it increases the inflammatory molecules and so on and so forth. And exercise is anti-inflammatory. The more you exercise you do, the less inflammation in your body and you look healthy. Then at the same time, we wanted to know how our cells recognize that there is, we have taken food and it's producing inflammation and what changes occur in the DNA and so on and so forth. A little bit of molecular biology. There's a very old uh, uh, laboratory test we used to do in back in 1980s when I was just completed my MBBS and joined Department of Genetics in Usman Institute to do research because I was never introduced to become a physician. But I was forced to become a physician, that is a different issue. And so we used to do a test, what is called as a micronuclease test. So if you look at this slide, there's a big bl blue thing, that is a nucleus. And next to that slide, the arrow shows a small, another blue dot. That is called as a micronucleus. So whenever there is a damage to DNA, this accumulates in the cell, in the cytoplasm. Cytoplasm means the, uh, the this, uh, area of the cell that is beyond the nucleus. It accumulates that. And now we found that in every disease, whether it is typhoid, malaria, COVID, you know, diabetes or hypertension, any disease, if you carefully take out the blood and then stain it and look for these cells, they are found. And the number of micronucleated cells in the circulation will reflect the amount of inflammation. If you have COVID, severe COVID, then the number of cells will be more. If it is less severe, the number of micronucleated cells will be less. And this is very paradoxical. And remember that if there, because there are some uh, industry people here, when you want to develop a drug, 
and when you are supposed to do preclinical toxicology studies, one of the tests that the FDA asks you to do is this micronuclease test. This is mandatory. Without that test, they will never approve your drug. Because they know that whenever there is any damage done by any drug or anything, the micronucleate cells will accumulate in the body. So this test I used to do in back in 1980, as a, you know, for some investigations and so on. So these micronucleate cells are extremely important. And so whenever there is damage or whenever there is any infection, then this is very interesting. Whenever you get any infection, virus, bacteria, fungal, whatever it is, to produce infection to your cells, it, the, this microorganism has to enter the cell. That means it has to pierce through the membrane and enter into the cytoplasm. And when this microorganism enters into the cytoplasm, that microorganism also has a DNA. Okay? So that DNA comes into the into your human cell that is infected with the microorganism and that nucleus or that DNA, the microorganism DNA is there in the cytoplasm of the cell. It is not supposed to be there because it is harmful to the body. So the cell has developed a mechanism by, by, by which it recognizes this foreign DNA in the cytoplasm. And this is a, a sensory mechanism that is present in the cell and this is called as sea gas sting system. Okay, don't bother about explanation and everything. Just remember, it is a sting. Okay, sting like a, we have a, a, a sting. Okay, so when it, when this uh, uh, sea gas sting system uh, uh, detects this foreign DNA, then immediately the genes meant for information are triggered. And they produce various cytokines, other molecules which produce inflammation, and that is how the inflammation occurs, whenever you get any infection. So that means when you are infected with bacteria, fungus, viruses, or, or even high glucose levels, then the sea gas sting system is activated and that produces inflammation. That means indirectly, whatever food you are taking, whatever infection that is occurring is acting on the DNA of your healthy cells. And the healthy cells, to protect themselves, they produce these molecules and they try to remove this DNA, this extra DNA or the micronucleus that is present in the cells. And body has developed a very clever mechanism to eliminate these micronucleated cells. So we did a study, one of the powerful inflammatory inciting agent is the radiation. Okay? So if you give radiation, it is a very powerful physical way of producing inflammation. And of course, that is also used for the treatment of cancer also. Okay? So we did a study, this is a slide showing micronucleated cells. And then because my interest is in lipids and all those things, we took a lipid several lipid molecules and injected them into the animal to see what is happening. Okay, then we found that these molecules, when we inject them, they eliminate these micronucleated cells from the body. That means these lipid molecules have the property to kill the cells which contain the extra DNA of the microorganisms and they eliminate them. And this is very interesting because whenever the microorganism is entering the cell by piercing the membrane, the enzymes that are present in the membrane are activated and they release these lipid molecules. That means the moment the microorganism is entering the cell, the, lipid the cell membrane also is activated and when cell membrane is activated, it releases certain lipid molecules and these lipid molecules in turn act on the same cell from which it is released to kill the cell so that these micronucleated containing cells are not there. Why that they should be eliminated is, if these micronucleated cells exist for a longer time in the body, they can get converted into cancerous cells. So that means there is damage to DNA and so they become cancerous after some time, so they have to be eliminated. So that is done by the, these lipid molecules. So these are all the publications in that area. Then we said, if these micronucleated cells are present in so many diseases, can we do something with these lipid molecules which we found that they are eliminating the, these uh, micronucleated cells. So we try to induce the diabetes in the animal model and then injected several lipid molecules and look at it, what is happening to diabetes status. Then we found that of all the lipid molecules we, uh, we investigated, some molecules can completely prevent diabetes. That means the same molecule which can eliminate the micronucleated cells in the body can also prevent development of diabetes. And we know that micronucleated cells, if they accumulate for a longer time, they develop into cancer. That means the same fundamental process occurs both in diabetes 
and in cancer. But the paradox here is, it is able to protect the pancreatic beta cells and prevent the diabetes, but when it comes to cancer cell, it will kill the cancer cell. That means the same molecule has two properties, depending upon the situation. It will kill the cell, in the case of cancer, it will protect the pancreatic beta cells to prevent the diabetes. This is a very, a very interesting uh, topic. Then, of course, we did a lot of studies to look at the diabetes and all those things, and we found that, yes, you can eliminate the uh, uh, diabetes by using this molecule. Then I'm not going to talk to you about the pathobiology of diabetes and all those things. So that means, then we said that diabetes and cancer are two sides of the same coin. In diabetes, you are trying to protect the pancreatic beta cells so that your insulin production is, is continuing to occur and you don't develop diabetes. When it comes to cancer, the same molecule will work on the micronutrient cells or the infected cell and then the abnormal cell and then kills them. So we, let us not bother about the mechanism because we know the mechanism also. Why it is able to produce the protection to the pancreatic beta cells at the same time, it is able to kill the cancer cell. I am not going to talk about it. Then of course we did some studies. And then we found that this molecule we can use for eliminating cancer cells. So we did a human clinical study of for brain tumors and injected this molecule and have shown that the cancer, the tumor can be regressive. Okay. So that means here you have a molecule that comes from our cell membranes and when we are infected, the membrane produces these molecules they produce inflammation and if these molecules are present in sufficient amounts, they are able to protect the pancreatic beta cells, so prevent developing from the diabetes. And if the cell happens to be a cancer cell, then this molecule is released, it will act on the cancer cell and eliminates it. So, so that's why we call it as diabetes and the cancer are two sides of the same kind. But there is a lot of mechanisms involved and then uh, there is molecular biology, I am not going to talk about it. Okay. So. Then, of course, we did uh, a lot of studies, and then now let us come to the. Uh, 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 let me see. Okay, uh, the, this is a slide, molecular biology slide, so I'm not going to talk to you about it. But then these molecules, these lipid molecules, have the property to work, uh, uh, to control the production of a molecule called as interferon. We all probably, many of you know, that interferon is an antiviral molecule produced in the body. So whenever you get an infection with viruses, interferon should be produced. So whenever you are infected with SARS virus, you should produce sufficient amounts of interferon to kill the virus, or virus so that you don't develop severe COVID or severe SARS-CoV-2 infection. But then this interferon molecule also again works on the cell membrane and then releases the lipid molecules so that these lipid molecules can in turn inactivate the virus. So these lipid molecules, they protect the pancreatic beta cells, they kill the tumor cells, and they also inactivate the viruses. And so now we subsequently we found that if we have enough amounts of these molecules in the body, they eliminate the SARS virus and you don't develop COVID. Or if you develop COVID, if you take these molecules, you recover from it very better. Then of course we did uh, some, several other studies. And what we found is that there is some sort of a uh, celestial dance occurring in the cells. Okay, when I was talking to my wife and shown her these slides, when we estimated several molecules going up, down, and so on. At the same time, we measured five or six molecules to see what is happening. So, say some molecules go up, some molecules go down, and then there will be like a dance. It is a very dynamic process. Every half an hour, every one hour, this dance of these molecules varies. Then I told my wife, this is like, a, like the celestial dance of Shiva. These molecules go up and down, and then they regulate the various processes. So we call it as a celestial dance of molecules to protect our cells from various diseases. And perhaps the celestial dance of Shiva that was described in the Vedas and others is probably an understanding of this. I don't know. So that is what we found that the celestial dance occurs. And what is most important is, in every disease process, whichever disease process you take, this celestial dance of molecules is same, is similar. Whether it is cancer, whether it is diabetes, whether it is myocardial infarction, or whether it is very, very severe inflammation like COVID. So, or uh, when I are exposed to radiation. So, I am not going to, yeah, just to slow, yeah, one slide. Yeah, this is, these are the molecules, you know, well, they vary up and down and so on and so forth. 
Then of course we said these molecules has actions on several other tissues as well. And these were how the molecules we measured, several molecules. And they go up and down. And it is, it is a very, uh, that is why when you measure these molecules only at one time point, you miss, the, uh, you miss the goal. You have to measure it continuously at different time intervals to see how they go up, go down, and they go up and go down, and so on and so forth. So this is the celestial dance of molecules is extremely important. This occurs in several diseases. Same type of uh, movement of the molecules occurs. Then we, of course, we did in several types of studies. Then we found that. Then we came to, we were interested in COVID also. Then we found that this molecule, this lipid molecule, is deficient in those patients who develop severe COVID. And if those molecules are produced in sufficient amounts, if their body has the sufficient stores of these lipid molecules, then the virus is inactivated and they require very fast. So of course, then we have put all the things together and then said that this is how the, the, we re react to infection or to injury or to inflammation and the, inf the process goes to nucleus, from nucleus it comes back and so on and so forth. Then this is what that happens in, in, uh, in COVID infection. So whenever you get the infection with COVID, the virus enters the cell and then it forms a micronucleated cell, then it activates the C gas cysting system and that leads to the release of these molecules. And if these lipid molecules are released in sufficient amounts, they are able to inactivate the virus, and so your cell uh, recovers. But sometimes what happens, the micronutrient cells are many. There are so many that the body tries to eliminate all those cells. And in the process, there will be a lot of damage to the tissues. Because if several cells are, uh, micronutrient cells are several are there, and if they are all eliminated, then naturally there will be damage. So that's what, that's what happens in severe SARS infection. So there is da damage to the endothelial cells of the blood vessels, pulmonary uh, uh, cells, pulmonary epithelial cells, and in the heart, and in the brain, and so on and so forth, depending upon where it is occurring. So they, that is what that happens in COVID. Then of course, yeah, um, I should thank all my collaborators, because without whose uh, help I could not have done all this work. This is a, this is a Hungarian group with whom we used to work. And this is a combination of about 30 or so people. And you'll be wondering that of, of them, at least six are physicists, physics people. And there are at least three or four are mathematicians. So we work with all of them together and then try to get ideas from different fields and see how best. This is a group with whom I work in China. And they, are, they, are, they are very nice students, except that we have difficulty in communicating with them with English, but they come, they learn and then come back. So with whom we did a lot of our work on insulin and uh, inflammation and so on and so forth. Then there's a group from Argentina where uh, we did a lot of work again on diabetes and other uh, conditions. And this is uh, my small group working with me in, in India. And they all have completed their PhDs and some of them are uh, uh, not here, they are in US and elsewhere. And they did wonderful work uh, with radiation and, and cancer and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was wonderful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.